Hello and thanks again for everyone joining us on the Nutrition, Health and Performance podcast with me, Jamie Pugh. Thanks for taking the time to, to download and listen to the episode today. We've got a fantastic guest lined up. Um, the guest today is former Commonwealth athlete, uh, medalist, in fact, at the Commonwealth Games in Olympic weightlifting and has gone on to have and still have a, a phenomenal career in, in strength and conditioning and, and weightlift coaching. He's previously worked uh, for the RFU, he's worked with Weightlifting Wales and is still involved there, and involved with Sport Wales as well. It's none other than Neil Taylor. Neil, how are we doing? I'm good, Jamie. Thank you. And um, and, and thanks for having me on. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm over the moon with this. I'm, and, again, and again, thanks. Um, no. Yeah, go on. Nothing. Where are we going to go, Jamie? So we're, we're going to start. I know you've got a list of questions for me. And yeah. I'm super excited to, to to try and answer these as best as I can in the in the current climate of this these special couple of months that we've all been going through. Well, that's where I was going to start. How have you been getting on? I suppose it's something like like the coaching that you do must have had a, a a big practical impact in terms of what you've been able to do with with athletes. And I suppose you've had as much uh, organising to do as you've had coaching these last couple of months. Yeah, no, no, certainly it, 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 it's been a, it's been a, it's been a, an experience. I have to say, um, not one that I'd like to go through, but <laughs> cir- circumstances are. Yeah, it is, it's been a lot of work. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually working for Sport Wales as a performance advisor, um, with a portfolio of sports, and you know, it, it's been, we've got athletes now returning to the envi- the training, the the daily training environment, such as as from tomorrow. We've got some um, some athletes and some para athletes um, who are going to be re- returning to the, the National Indoor Athletic Centre, which is based at Cardiff Med. Um, and, and like I said, the, the, the work that's gone into that um, has been phenomenal. You know, there, there's hundreds and hundreds of man hours that have gone into the the return to training documents that need to yeah. be. Need, need to be in place bef- um, the risk assessments etc um, for the first for the first cohort which as I said will be re- returning tomorrow they have, a, they, have an, they have an hour at the track on Tuesday tomorrow and then they have an hour on Thursday um, loads and loads of procedures um, health checks they um, they have apps that they have to fill in um, in the morning before nine o'clock and then that's uploaded to a system. That's checked by the medics, um, and then when they arrive on site, those questions are asked of them again, and they also take their temperature as well. Um, and if it's over a certain certain level, then they they don't get to return on that day, and they have to um, other procedures put in place to cope with that. So so that's been that's been really really um, it's been really atricious on all the staff. Um, and in Juno, you know, we, uh, we've been working lots with the M- the NGBs, uh, yeah. highly involved with with producing their their own strategies to return, but are in line with with Sport Wales and the and the government, the Welsh governments. So yeah, it's been it's been big. So prior as when we came into lockdown, um, working with the athletes remotely was a challenge, um, and we've been very very successful at that. Um, and that's that, that, you know, that, that is down to the the quality of practitioners that we have um, working um, working for Sport Wales, um, and 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 the, and the wider practitioners that, that we use, the contractors. So you know, it's been it's been it's been a learning curve for all of us. But as I said, not not one that, that we'd wish to wish wish to go f- through again. Um, and you know, all I mean, all I would say, you know, it's just. It, is on the back of COVID and just, just listen to everybody out to listen to the guidelines, listen to the guidelines, stay safe. Um, you know, and for us, you know, there's no big rush back to training because the sport, several of the sports are not, are not ready in their performance calendars. So, yeah. so there, there aren't, there aren't any competitions being held as yet. So, but it, but it is for the, for the mental health of the athlete. Um, it, you know, it, it is important that they return to some type of normality, um, all that with with a lot of procedures around them. 
and as I say, there's a few points, isn't there? There, I think the first one, as you said, it's yes, it's atricious and it's it's been a new challenge. And as you said, all of the the documentation and the legal stuff can build up and is building up at the minute. But as you say, it's so important, especially if there is second wave or further lockdowns or anything like that, because hopefully it just means that plans are in place or it avoids the need for, for things like this to happen again. And exactly like you said is, is similar to some of the athletes that I've been working with at the minute in that, yes, there are sports like football that, you know, there's been this big rush to get the Premier League back restarted. And, and so their pressures are different to other sports. Whereas like you said, the performance uh, calendar just isn't there yet. So it's more about return to routine, get them back into training get them ready and as you, hopefully that structure and routine around them just helps with that mental side of things as well because as you say you take that away um whether it was the olympics this summer or, or any other major championships and uh, now you've put that a 12 month delay in it it can be pretty tough how have some of the athletes coped with that has it been i, I can imagine a, a range of of emotions with it but has there been was it tough for something to take when when they hear things like you know Olympics being put off or any other world championships being put off? Yeah, no, I mean it it, it is stressful for any athlete who's who's, who's a high performer because you know p- performing at the at the highest level is is what is what they train for, you know, and and, and you know when when that gets dampened down, you know, there, there's a lot of stress around, a lot of uncertainty for athletes, especially those guys who maybe it's their it's their last big championship I know that's been postponed for another 12 months so that's another 12 months now of of um, of preparation and you know your, your, your dosing of of, uh, of your training is is going to change um, compared to where it, what it was you know because we, we, we'd be looking probably now where in another month um, lots of our athletes or the, the GB athletes are handed over and they get looked after by GB ready to go into um, the holding camps and and the game, so you know, so that's all out the window. Um, and you, you athletes, you know, there are a lot of athletes out there that you know, married or, or with partners, and they have children. Um, so there's all, all all that to take into consideration as well. You you know, you have your children at home. Um, you have to entertain your children. You have to do the schoolwork, and then on top of the stresses that you have, you know, you have to find, um, you know, how how are you going to tra- how are you going to train? Yeah. So how, what we've spent a lot of time doing was looking at um, athletes who had garages and areas of training. We sport wheels have been very, very good in loaning um, loaning equipment out to those those selected athletes who we deem as medal winning. Um, and yeah, and then, you know, and then putting in the, the remote sports science and medicine around that. Um, so we've virtu- lots of virtual coaching sessions. That have been that have been done with Sport Wales and the NGBs into their athletes, um, and there's multi multidisciplinary team meetings every week for those athletes where we um, where the athlete joins it and we, we we get them to the nitty gritty of what's happened throughout the working week and what the action plan is for the following week. So yeah, and it's um yeah it's a it's a it's a big it's a big piece of work. They say it's it's probably. There's never a good time for this, but you said, I think hopefully at least for, for athletes at the top end, there is such now that structures and support is in place that they've, they've probably had to be, yes, resourceful and and, um, and accountable to themselves, but there is support around them as well. And it maybe then delves nicely into to what I wanted to, to get onto in terms of the differences you then maybe see to when you were competing. Um, and, and was it a case that there was that, much less level of support um because what can you imagine what it would have been like if, if this would have been i don't know something similar would have been uh in place when when you were competing um yeah we we we, we didn't have we didn't have grants we didn't have monies we didn't have um we had very very limited access to um to a physiotherapist um and which we had to pay for um we didn't have we didn't have a a medic as such who would be there around throughout the week to give advice and guidance. We certainly didn't have any, any nutrition support, which, uh, which these days, you know, that's the game changer. That's been crucial to all the, the rugby players and athletes that I've worked with um, over the years. 
We don't have any 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 of that. No psychologists. You know, you 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 had your training, your training team, and they your training buddies. They they, they were your they were your psychologists. They were your coaches. Um, they were your mums, your dads, your brothers when you were away uh, as as a young competing athlete. Um, but yeah, but so we didn't know. We didn't have any, we didn't have anything basically. And you know, we I, I think you know we we were we had to be quite robust in the way that we worked. Do you, do you see? I'm not saying it's for for better or for worse, but do you then see a difference in in a, in mentalities between athletes now and maybe when you were competing? Um, I, I, do I see a difference? I mean, I you know, I, I think I think we can we can over prescribe services to athletes, and I don't think in the long run it does them. Um, does in the world of good, you know, we 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 do surround the athlete these days with a with a lot of service, and um, and it's not that that it's not out of jealousy, but I think I think my generation trained they didn't train as smart as he, as as people did do today, but I think um, I think we we learned a lot. We learned at an early age to be more mature. In, in our training environment, um, and, I, and I, you know, I, I, I think I mean, there's lots of there's lots of factors around, isn't it? I was going to say, and it's always difficult because it, you can never do that experiment where you could take you from from back in the day and and be put in today's environment and vice versa. Today's athletes be put back then, and said, I suppose it's always going to be a consequence of that environment you're working in a little bit. Um, one one of the things I wanted to ask then is is when you when you were sort of coming to the to the end of, of competing, was the or was the focus or was the intention, sorry, always to go into coaching and stay in sport afterwards, or was that an opportunity thing, or what was the what was the pathway that led to that? Uh, nothing really. I mean, I got, when I say nothing, um, so I, I started lifting Olympic weights technically when I was age eleven um, in a place called Cumbrian Stadium. Which uh, no gym there now as such Olympic weightlifting gym. Um, it's just an ordinary leisure centre. Uh, and I, I trained there with with a, with, a, with a group of of of, of, of other so, um, weightlifters who, who were doing it uh, just as the weekend warrior, if if you want for want of a better term. But also within that environment, we we had um, a uh, shop put of Vinnie ahead, who was an Olympian. Colin Jackson would train in the same gym, so you know we 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 had a, a good cohort of people there to to learn off. So, uh, I first I won I won the Welsh Senior title at fifteen, my British schoolboy title, um, and Welsh schoolboy titles, and then I, I went on to a lot more senior titles, and British junior titles, and under twenty three championship medals. Um, my first Commonwealth Games was in nineteen eighty six. I was nineteen years of age. Um, no no mobile telephones, nothing at all. Um, we flew from Cardiff to Edinburgh, um, which was nice because as, as a young young lad, you didn't get much you didn't get much opportunity to do that, uh, and it competed really well. So I medalled at, at the eighty six games, and nineteen ninety, I, I I got injured, and so I didn't I didn't compete for two years, and then I came back for the ninety four Commonwealth Games, um, and I came fourth. Um, my mother hadn't long passed away, uh, the sort of nine months before that, so. Um, it was a very testing time for myself and, and my family. I had a young sister who was eighteen years of age, and it was a it was a bit of a um, mm, bit of a, a life changing experience, as you can imagine. Um, so yeah, so I competed there in ninety four. That was in Canada. Went on to the ninety eight games in Malaysia in Kuala Lumpur. Didn't compete very well, to be fair. And that was my last my last uh, ever competition. I was come home from that and. Just decided that you know my my time was my time was no longer in in weightlifting uh, or, or as a competitor. So I tried. I, I went on to do several different things. I um I worked in a factory for a while to get some money to put to put in the bank because um, I, I I wanted to purchase a house. Um, and then I worked for Scope, which is formerly the Spastic Society, um, working in adult services. And then I went on through that organisation to 
manage a project called Trailblazers Wales, which is a respite care project for uh, young disabled children, um, where we uh, take the children away for with the, the help of the local authorities and district nurses, where we go sailing, climbing, canoeing of a weekend, or we'd have a whole Monday to Friday holiday within the um, within a, within the half terms. Um, so yeah, I did that for a couple of years, and I started coaching weightlifting. Then again, on on you know just uh, amongst groups of friends, um, and I, I I got that I got that bug back for for coaching. And for being in that environment, and that's when um, I got introduced to Phil Richards, as we all know um, from PRP, um, and involved with yourself, Jamie, uh, down in down in uh, down in, in in the Neath area. Phil was um, I was introduced to Phil by Richard Harry. Richard it, Richard now is the chief chief executive of Sports Resolutions in London. Um, at that current time, Richard was setting up the, the Welsh Rugby Players Association, um, and that was interesting because I I, 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 I was introduced then to this to this gentleman who just seemed to have read every book in on that you could ever imagine was written on the, the subject of strength and conditioning and nutrition, hydration. You know, he was just one of the smartest men I. I I'd, I'd come across, and you know, Phil was Phil. I don't know if many people know this. Phil was the um, he was a strength and conditioning coach for Swansea Rugby Football Club um, under his lesion with the likes of Scott Gibbs, etc. Um, yeah. Phil Phil led in its area. He was the first ever full time strength and conditioning coach, as I'm aware, in in Europe. Um, and he, he 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 was working closely with his assistants, Alex Alex Lawson, who uh, who I know you you know as well, Jim. You know, Alex went on. Alex has gone on for a very successful career in, in the SNC world. You know, working with um, he's currently with the Ospreys as head of SNC. Um, he was head of SNC at Newport Gwent Dragons, and he left there after a four year stint to go to Japan, I believe, if I'm right. Um, and so I was introduced to these guys, and I was I was able to go down and watch Phil and Alex coach down in Swansea, and it just fascinated me. That, you know, I. I I never dreamed that the world of strength, strength and conditioning was was like this. I, you know, we come from the oldy worldy place of uh, it was just go and lift weights on Monday and Tuesday and see how you get on. Um, but yeah, so I learned, learned a, a huge amount from 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 Phil, and Phil was instrumental in bringing me into rugby. Then, so in, in 2000 and, 2002, um, Phil had moved to Worcester Rugby Football Club. As their lead strength and conditioning coach, and um, and he made inroads in that club. Um, and what Phil understood as well was not just his is the way that he understood S and C and 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 nutrition. It's the way that Phil understood the players, and he was able to get the best out of them. And you know that the last season of Phil's at Worcester before the, you know they they I think it was thirty six out of thirty six games that that they'd won. Never had a loss, and then you know, all the players at that particular time just raved about Phil Richards and, and the experience he brought to that club and um, and the challenges. You know, Phil, Phil is a tough operator. You know, Phil will give you black and white, so there's no there's no ways and graces there. This is the information. This is where we're going with it. This is the changes it's going to make to you, the adaptations it's going to make, um, and let's crack on. So, yeah, learned and learned an awful awful, awful lot from that. Um, in the in. In that period where I worked with Phil at Worcester, I was introduced to a gentleman called uh, Roy Heddy. Roy Heddy um, worked for the Rugby Football Union as elite services manager at that time, and then post uh, post that he was um, he was head of uh, sports science and medicine. So um, I, 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 there was a job presented um, on the market, and I applied for it as a strength coach working in the National Academy. Um, under Brian Ashton, and so I started with the RFU, part time, two and a half days a week in July two thousand and four. Um, as I said, working in a pathway, working with a, in the National Academy and the, the Senior National Academy and the Junior National Academy, um, and, and those camps were held at Bath, and that was a massive eye opener for me because the, the, the level of detail that was going in to each player was was phenomenal. Um, all the services we 
uh, you and I know that's available now with, with, with around those players. Um, and I was that was a really really exciting time. So I I, you know, I worked I worked for the Rugby Football Union from two thousand and four until two thousand and sixteen. Um, within that within that period, uh, I covered as a lead S and C coach um, four Junior World Cups, um, and we'd um, sorry five actually. 2012, 2013 was the first time that England had won a Junior World Cup, and that was in France, um, uh, where we we beat uh, we beat Wales. A real good experience uh, for for staff and players alike. And then we travelled to New Zealand in 2014, and we won in New Zealand. So we had that was a back to back for us. And that was the first time that that's been done. Um, and 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 again, we we. we we played South Africa in the final, and it was one of the most atricious matches that I've ever been involved with. It was, it was, it was brutal. The the Saffirs came across; they were an extremely big, fit side, um, but we stepped up to the plate. The, the the condition of the players was 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 top notch, and that and the big thanks to that was, and the big thanks still is to the clubs, the the, the twelve Premiership clubs. And uh, the two championship clubs that make up the fourteen academies, um, and then two thousand fifteen, we uh, we travelled to Brescia in Italy, where we we got the final. We lost in the final to New Zealand, and then um, and then the following year, two thousand sixteen, Junior World Cup in Manchester, we we had we had a great a great cohort of players again, and pushed the boat out, and um, and yeah, and we 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 beat Ireland in the final. So that was three junior cup, junior world cups in, in four years. Um, after that, um, I decided that I needed to move out of rugby. Um, I, I, I saw a job coming up with weightlifting Wales for the Commonwealth Games, and it was just something that I I I, I wanted to do an individual sport. And so I applied for I applied for the job, and I, and I was really fortunate uh, to, to get to get the gig. And then that 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 was a whole new world again. So you know we were we were preparing individual athletes in to to compete on one, one of the biggest stages in in, in the world. And um, and that, that was certainly that was certainly exciting. We travelled out there in two thousand and seventeen um, to compete in the Commonwealth Championships, which was the testing championships ready for the. Um, Ready for the games the following year, and um, and yeah, we had a great great experience in the Gold Coast with Gareth Evans um, picking up Wales' first gold medal as a team, um, and he, he was he was just phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. And then um, and then we had a, we had we had a, we had a bronze medal in a, in the women's weightlifting. So so yeah, so that's where I headed, um, sort of post competing. And up and through, and then leaving leaving weightlifting Wales, which I did. Um, I left uh, 2019 um, in the May to take a performance advisor's role with Sport Wales, and I sit in Sport Wales as a performance advisor, working with a portfolio of sports, um, and that's really exciting. That's very dynamic, and you know you get. Uh, the conversations you have in there are different than the ones you had in rugby and weightlifting, and you, you just you got you, you. I have a big thirst for that environment and for the performance environment. So, you know, it's it's not it's not it's, I don't find it laborious. It's thoroughly enjoyable. I work with some of the best practitioners in in the world, um, an outstanding team, um, a very helpful team, and you know, very proud to be in that environment. It's, it's uh, an incredible, incredible story in your journey. journey. It's amazing. I'm sure one that a lot of people would be jealous of. Um, as you were just talking, I was just writing down questions and thoughts. The The first one I wanted to pick up on, as you said, you spent a long time in rugby. And, and I can imagine that things obviously changed throughout that time. But how did, how did you... Stay, for want of a better word, Tim, how did you stay motivated throughout all of that? Because I, I suppose for a lot of people, it would be easy to sort of sit in, get comfortable with the routine, and almost do the you know something similar year on year on year. I think 
I think the difference is what what you have in the in the in the pathway is that you every every year the different players coming through, so players players coming up from the under sixteen age group and being recognised and then being come become part of the under age and the under eighteen uh, national academy, um, in the under twenties. You see them moving through that system, um, but then you know then then you've got another you know the start of the start of the season there's another ten players coming in that, that you don't know. And you you have to work really really hard to get to know these players. Um, you know you spend a lot of time on the road, a lot of time in the clubs, um, staying overnight. I think I counted up. I think it's about seven and a half months of the year that you're away from your own home um, when you're in that in that role. And it really is really interesting to see how the how the academies grew. You know from 2004 up until I left and. And how you know how how they evolved? It, it was it, it's fascinating. The quality work that the, the Premiership Academies produce is is, is mind blowing. You know, and when in England rugby have to be extremely thankful to the dedication of the staff in those academies um, for producing the England player who is who's who's there today. Um, so yeah, you know. It, 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 I wouldn't say it wasn't hard to stay motivated because it was extremely busy dealing with like 12 premiership clubs, um, two championship clubs, so you got 14 academies. This is every week. Every Friday we'd have um, we'd have a list uh, for over 64 players to go through as a sports science and medicine team, which would start on Friday 8 o'clock. We'd finish around 10 and we'd go through all the players on that list um, to discuss how they were physically um, going into the games on the weekend. And then that leads nicely into the you you sort of touched on it, but what you you sort of said you enjoyed then going back to work with individual athletes. What was the 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 biggest draw there, rather than go back into to team sport initially? Well, I'd never done it, and I was nervous about it. And it's like, well, if you don't, you know, if you don't stick your head above the parapet, you're not, you're never going to know. And you know, you're new, and you because if you think, um, you know, I had a successful career in rugby, but if you think you if you think you're, you're fully rounded as a coach and as a person, well, you're in the wrong room. You, you, you have to keep evolving. You have to keep learning. And, um, you know, obviously I understood weightlifting. Um, reading, reading the scoreboard of weightlifting is, um, it's, it's a big, um, it's a big skill. And I, and I I was always really good at it as a as a weightlifting competitor reading reading the scoreboard. So I knew how many lifts I had to go before it was my turn on a platform. So you have to periodize that 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 half an hour before you're on the platform really really well to make sure you're the best position to be uh, to be on that platform, primed, ready ready to lift. So so there was that about it as well. Um, and so that was a, that was a, that was a challenge for me. And obviously, I competed at the Commonwealth Games, and you know, I wanted to see what it was like from the other side as a coach, because the the athlete doesn't see what the coach goes through. The athlete thinks the coach rocks up the training with just a, you know, um, just them some nice words and to sort of help educate you. But there's loads more that goes beyond on, in behind the scenes, as as I know you're aware of, Jim. So um, yeah, so that's that. I suppose that's the only way I can explain that. And and you said you obviously had uh, great success again there, and and then moving into the role at Sport Wales, what were some of the biggest lessons you took then from as a as a co- strength recognition coach and working with other practitioners that you have now taken into, as you said, a role that is now maybe a bit more. Managerial, I suppose, in a way, overseeing bigger programs rather than being a, a smaller part of inner program. Were there were there things that you you experienced day in day out that you really wanted to try and avoid or or try and ensure that you you made better than than what you you'd seen in, in all those years? Yeah, I think so. And you know, when, like I said, when you when you go into an environment again, um, rugby had some of the best practitioners in the world, and alongside Sport Wales. And it's just sharing your experience of where you've, where you've come from um, and just to really table what changes you think you can make um, using using the cohort of staff around you because, you know, it, it's really good. It's very, very healthy. We can just sit around and have a chat for, over a coffee. Loads and loads of nuggets come up to, to move the environment forward. Um, 
I don't specifically look after the programs of the sports um, in my portfolio. I'm there more as an advisor around the sports science and medicine team and, um, and helping those perform, performing coaches within that environment um, gain access to some of the um, uh, some of the upskilling work that they need. Um, so yeah, so that's a that's where that that's where that sits at the minute with me. Do you ever? Uh, you must still then see, especially in young practitioners, see them making maybe some of the same mistakes you made early on. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I, they, within Wales, see, we, we the, the young practitioners, we we don't we we've got some world we got world beaters in there, you know, who've got far much more knowledge than than, than I have, and and the environment is such that we can, we're able to lean on each other. You know, and, and and make that informed decision. So that and that and that's exciting to list to listen to the experiences of others, and and to listen to the the, the knowledge, um, and you know, and, and that still fascinates me. And I'm, I'm forever grateful to the people I work with, because they they they're, they're always they're forward thinking people, and and they will they will come to your table, and they will assist in the in in any way, shape, or form. So yeah, you know, um, yeah, big thanks to them. Um, if, if if they get to listen to this, no, oh, I, I I can I can see where you're coming from with that because I I, I see the same thing day in day out in in Liverpool John Moores and it, it's almost frustrating to a point where I could I could and so, sometimes do want to spend my day just talking to people in and around the building because you said because they're so knowledgeable yeah. um, that you, you do just want to soak it in and learn a little bit and it's it's almost. Uh, that you don't want to get on with your own job because there are, there is so much knowledge just in and around you. I mean, look, forget forget road sets and reps. You know, it's about your relationships, your relationships with the athletes, your relationships with the coaching staff, and you know, and that 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 doesn't take five minutes to build. You have to really, really work hard at that. Um, but the benefits of that, once you've nailed it, is um, it, it it's not exhausted. You know, it's not it's not exhausted. Um, the benefits are that you you you. You're able to push world class programs further. Um, yeah, so that's real. Really, you know, I mean, it's been, you know, it, it, when we talk about um, the biggest, you know, you do biggest struggles in, in environments and, you know, the biggest lessons learned, you know, it's, for me, for me, like in rugby, was um, was getting the coaches to buy in the, in the early days to S and C. So, it's, you know, you, you, have, you have quite a few coaches in, in that. Era that hadn't really done S and C when they were players in the amateur days. Um, so when when you're seeing that as a, as a coach coming in, you know it really. I think it. I think it used to phase quite a few of them. So they they just used to poo poo it off. But so that was a struggle um, for quite a few years getting them to understand that you know strength and conditioning is there for a purpose. Um, you know, no more so than injury prevention. Um, and as we see today, we see the difference in the size of the player over the last fifteen years. It's um, it's it's it's, it's mind blowing. Um, and then and then you know traveling with traveling with teams, you know, um, and if things for people to think about that, that we don't necessarily think of, you know, see, are you going? You're doing a long haul travel. You know, we we traveled South Africa, New Zealand, Australia quite a few times, and it's trying to get. The relevant seats on the aircraft for the for the players. You've got the tall players, the, the big players. You know, historically, it was just rock up the airport and jump on a plane and you know have the seat that the the girl at the front desk had, or the man at the front desk had given you. Um, and then you get there and you find that you know you weigh you weigh 120 kilo um, and you're six feet four and yet you're stuck in the middle of a row with um, with other people who you don't know. So you, so you, you have no, you have hardly any conversation on your flight. You're stuck there. You're very uncomfortable, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, get around that. So start. We started to, or I started to work on on lots of relationships with them, um, with the airlines, getting to know the relevant staff in there that could change all that for us, introducing who we were, um, getting those relationship built. So in the end, after a couple of years, we were able to ring the airlines and pick our own seats on, on a plane, which does make an, an awful lot of um, an awful lot of difference, especially when, you know, at, at, at pathway level, under, under 18s and 20s, um, you know, d there's no budget to fly business class like the senior sites. Um, 
and that, that just doesn't happen. Um, funny thing, we, I remember, I just remember France, France in 2016 for the for the, the, the Six Nations. We got to the hotel um, and they were short on staff, so breakfast the following morning. So I pitched in with the other chef um, in the hotel and cooked the breakfast for the players. And I was that was interesting. So having sort of having all these pans and things going with water and vinegar, cooking hundreds and hundreds of poached eggs was well, it was it was it was, um, it was a real yeah that was that was that was an eye opener for me. It was uh, it, it was good. It was it was quite funny actually. Um, and and that, um, as I say, that resourcefulness though, and everything you're saying there are all the things that people that maybe looking from the outside in wouldn't necessarily appreciate or think of first of all, but they are all of the things, as you said, that an athlete does appreciate beyond just the, as you said, the reps and the sets or the, the, the conditioning program, however it is, you only need those little negatives for an athlete to lose, not trust in you, but as you said, that relationship dampens, where if you can do all of those things for an athlete, and you can be resourceful. You can think outside the box. You can be willing to to pitch in and muck in in something that maybe isn't your job. I think athletes really respond to that. And obviously, you have to be a competent and a, a good or a great practitioner as well in terms of your knowledge. But I think if you you're not humble and, and as I said, resourceful, inventive, then I think that's maybe what stops good coaches becoming great coaches. The ones that athletes really remember. Yeah, and we, you know, we um, on European venues, and, and I think some some travelling sites will, will experience this still. Um, is 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 the type of nutrition that's available to you? You you, you getting your getting your, your your staple breakfast in um, doesn't happen because you know you you you're in France and you're having croissants for breakfast, and you know you're you're spiking your insulin levels all over the place. You know, there are the things that. You know that were really difficult. So I, I started wrecking venues three months before we travelled there. Then I go out a day before the team. I'd speak to the chefs in the ho- in the hotel, um, the hotel management. I'd speak to the cleaners, um, and I would speak to the cleaners because I want to know what was in the bins and the hotel rooms um, in the mornings. So if there's any chocolate wrappers in there, biscuits wrappers, <laughs> I wanted to know that. And it wasn't out of devilment. It was actually because. On on the on the wellness sheets that are filled in every morning, um, you know your quality of sleep is on there, and yeah. if your quality of sleep is poor, we all know this. I'm not going to tell Granny to, to suck age here. We know that, that sleep is the best form of recovery that you can have. If that's impaired, then you know we need to know why, and that can be a simple thing. Is then you know it's not about challenging the players who've got biscuit wrappers in their bins or chocolate bars. It's actually they need educating, and then and that's when. Um, that's when uh, I bumped into Graham Close. I bumped into Graham um, in Exeter Chiefs, and we, we we struck up a relationship there, um, where Graham started to help with some of our younger players within the pathway, and then that led on to the introduction of um, of your colleague Andy Casper. Casper coming in to look at the pathway and the nutrition process in the in the pathway uh, under Graham's. Uh, under Graham's guidance, Graham moving on then to the senior side. So I, I, I think if I'm right, um, your team look after all the pathway now in the Premiership. That's both that's both the, the men's game and the women the women's game, um, and also the senior side, um, and may, and has made a massive inroad. So it was and I, I'm trying to think of the date. It probably would have been about 2014. When or 2013, when, when Graham decided that you know we 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 were using lots of powd, lots of powders, protein powders, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and you know was was this the right thing to be doing? So it was all revamped, and we went down the real food chain route. So at England pathway camps and junior world cups, you wouldn't see many um, recovery shakes out. Because we went down the food, it costs a lot. It was a big, big pull on a budget. But you know, when we've, when you're seeing fresh smoked salmon out um, at lunchtime, and quali- and other quality foods to um, to fuel the sessions, 
And then you can see the way the sessions were going, um, the amount of energy that we're in sessions, the amount of clarity that we were having at meetings because we were fueling appropriately with clean food. And so it made a massive, you know, that, that was a that was a huge change, you know, huge change for us. It was one of the biggest lessons we learned, you know, and um, and we had some young players, and I'll, 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 I can name these because and they were my the, the Leeds players, the Jack Walkers of of this world, the Lewis Boyces, you know, had, had gone back to their clubs and and just and and spoke to their their managers and coaches to say, look, can can we just have a, a can we have the same food chains we've been been fed um, with the RFU? Because you know we feel different, we feel better, we want to move away from pills and other shakes and and just eat eat clean. And and, and they accept it. And then and, and when you look at the, the the club environments out there now, and the majority of clubs now employ chefs full time. They have nutritionists full time, and they, they 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 collaborate really well in providing this quality. Um, nutrition service that really underpins a working environment of of of, of the players, um, and like I said, we we were fortunate. We got on the back of this quite a few years ago, and yeah, um, it was a uh, it, yeah it was it was a, it was it was brilliant for us. I can't I can't I can't thank Graham and Liverpool John more enough to, to the way that it's been it's been a massive game changer. I have to be fair. Um, no, I- so Graham's done a, introduced a lot of great changes, and, and as you said, the 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 point there about the the food first, it's it's so true because for, for so many reasons, because it's yes, you can get enough protein from a shake, but it's what do you, what's your next meal then going to look like? On the flip side, if your protein's coming from some fresh salmon or some some you know chicken breast and like that, you're probably also going to have that with some vegetables or a salad or of a nutritious food rather than just eat the eat it to get the protein and he said all of that has has big knock-on effects and as knock-on effects on their their other nutrition lifestyle choices for hopefully with being introduced to that age years to come and throughout their their whole career yeah no certainly that's right and you know and like i said loads of lessons to be learned but but the one i would i would just encourage you if you are a conditioner out there, and it, 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 this is your gig um move in the teams and make sure everything's in place. Um, don't presume anything. Don't presume that, that the hotel still know it. Get there the day before. Don't presume that members in your own team um, know where you should be going with it because, you know, I, 2016 was in Leicester and, you know, I had to rely on a member of staff. Uh, it wasn't their fault. They, they, they weren't um, weren't qualified in this area. But to, um, to make sure that the nutrition... Um, on the last day of the camp in the afternoon was was uh, was followed to the guidelines. That didn't happen. So post training there was a little doggy bag in there with crisps, biscuits, um, panda pop. Because the environment we were in, we had to go and train at a school and they just didn't the 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 nutrition plan that was sent through didn't get to the chefs. Um, and it just went pear shaped. And so you had lots of complaints from the players who were absolutely famished. They'd had a hard training session, so you can imagine lots of long faces. So yeah, don't don't, don't ever presume. Make sure it's in place. And 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 I always did it myself because I just knew. And then I'd, I'd feed that back down through the management that it was taken care of. That's the biggest lesson for me. Yeah, so there's some absolute gems in there. I I, I can see the time here, and I, I, I don't want to take too much more of your time. I know I know how busy you are, but it would be it'd be wrong of me to have you on and not uh not get a few tips and pointers for people maybe as they they start to get back into the gyms. Yeah. Um, for for anyone then, as you said, once maybe the gyms do start to open or people can get their hands on some weights again, what? What would you, would you be advising for some of the athletes? You know, if they haven't been able to pick up a, a weight for, you know, let's say two three months, and, and they're going to get back in the gym, what would what would you be looking to do with them? I think with the athletes, we I mean, we're not experiencing this because every athlete is. We've got a, a as I said, a fantastic sports science and medicine team, and we've we've um, they have been dosing the athletes appropriately over this lockdown period. Because um, as you alluded to earlier on, Jamie, you know there isn't there isn't any program apart from apart from football. Um, there isn't any programs out there that are running at, at, at presently. 
So, so we don't know is, is the answer there. Is, is taking coming back in the environment. It's going to start tomorrow. Um, but if, for anybody returning, and I think this is this is for the general public as well. You know, you, I think you've got to ask yourself for, in the first instance: Do you in this in this particular period of uncertainty, when we know very very little about where COVID lies, we, we can't see it, but where is it? Um, do you really need to go back to the gym? Do you really need, need to go back to that gym where you know where you you you're exerting and mo- the moisture in the air is getting damp, and you're there, and you know, and and ask yourself the question, you know, what what have we learned in the last four months as people exercising? I think we've realised that we can do a lot more outdoors than we'd ever expected, and. You know, and I think uh, you know out, outdoor training. Um, I think it's a lot healthier for for f- from a mindfulness point of view that you're outside and you can go for a, a jog or a, a, and you can do some sprints outside rather than on a, on, a, on a on a running machine indoors in a gym and using weights outside. You can there's lots of facilities where you can do your press ups, your pull ups, um, to just keep yourself uh, in that shape for the for the uh, for the competing athlete. Or the professionals, you know, your your national governing bodies are your first point of call to find out if it's safe for you to go back to training, and and they have lots of information for you. Um, you know, asking yourself how how have you coped in the lockdown? You know, if you've been doing some good things, well, continue to do them. Um, and uh, you know, and uh, and 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 have, you know, if you've improved in in certain areas, you know, again, continue to do that. What's the risks and rewards? Or the risks of of going into probably going into a, a big gym now, and, and we, we we certainly I think this will happen on the, on when gyms are allowed to open. You know you're going to get a large cohort of people that want to go in, and they're going to be quite full. So taking all those all that into considerations, you know, follow a plan. Don't just go in and, and 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 make things up. You know you've um you've had quite a long time off, and you should just ease back in with some. Some low volume and low intensity work. Um, I mean, and that can look like that could look like one or two, you know, sort of light light sets of around I don't know, in anything you know, eight eight exercises. Let's just say eight or ten um, complex exercises, like deadlifts, bench press, overhead pressing, squats. Um, because you're gonna you know you're gonna go through a, a level of soreness then with your your delayed onset muscle soreness. So the day after and the and the day after. I mean we all we all understand that that's gonna ease off and then, then you can start prescribing your training a bit differently. Yeah, the the first part of that answer I absolutely loved. And uh, as soon as you said it, it, it genuinely brought a smile to my face when you said that even before getting into rep sets or programming, just think, do I need to go to the gym? And hopefully, as you said, I, I'm in almost exactly the same mindset where I hope what it has done for a lot of people is is make them realise that they can be inventive or there are other ways to train. And that that's not to take away from the the fitness industry. And I, and I know they're crying out for, for gyms to be open and for money to be put back into that industry. Um, so it's not to take away from them at all. But I said the last thing I'd, you, I'd imagine most people would want to see is that gyms open and it's it's packed in there. It's, you know, there's uh, people touching equipment and there's, there's just an increased risk. Um, so yeah, when you said that, it, it actually it genuinely brought a little bit of a, a smile to my face because it's. Uh, I didn't think that's what you'd go with, uh, but no, I'm, I'm really glad you, you said something like that. And again, you know, we we, we all understand that post COVID, you know, we we will be back to the gyms, we will be back to the environment. They're, they're going to look a lot different, but we all like training. It's it's the social aspect of going to the gym as well. You know, it's 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 so beneficial for your mental health. But as I said, until we, until we just have to be, gov- you know, we're always governed by what the what the government, what the professionals are telling us, and from the the, the, the science, um, yeah, and and that, that's all you can do at the, at the minute. Uh, Perfect, Neil. Listen, I, I, we're pushing it for time, and um, I, I'm really appreciate you coming on. I think some of the stuff I've taken here, I've been jotting things down as we've been talking. Uh, I'm probably going to listen back to this again pretty pretty quickly once we finished but um, just before we go um where if people want to sort of see more of your stuff or to interact a little bit 
where's where's some of the best places? I think you're quite active on Twitter. Um, yeah, I think people can contact me on 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 Twitter. I'm more, more happy happy to just connect with people, and you know, it's not whether it's to talk about you know um, the, them developing um, or CPD or and whether it's to develop me. I'm really happy. You know, I'm I'm always I'm I'm just I'm, I'm I've got a thirst for learning, and I'm I'm really happy for somebody to tap me on the shoulder and say, look, I've got something here that may improve the way that you work. Um, so I'm 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 always up for that, and you know if I can if I can give anybody any tips on Olympic weightlifting, you know I, I I'm I'm more than happy to, and I can share this with with anybody. You know if if anybody wants to take up or learn Olympic weightlifting, find yourself an Olympic weightlifting gym, and they're on the British weightlifting um, website, and you, there, there's an array of gyms across the country with some some great coaches. Um, don't overcomplicate those lifts because they're not complicated. Um, there are lots of books out there. There are lots of YouTube videos that do overcomplicate them. But so if you get get to get to a good Olympic gym and you you will learn you learn a skill that will that will last you for, for your life. And you've know, been been able to do basic snatching or clean and jerking at times. Um, you know you, you be patient when you're learning. Um, but they're great lifts to learn as part of our strength training, especially when you've got limited time to train when you're in work and you may have 35 minutes, 40 minutes. Um, you know, you can you can warm up, empty barbell through, uh, do six six sets of, of clean and jerks, and you know, and you've nailed a good all over, all over session. Yeah, perfect. Now, listen, I've loved talking to you today. Thank you so much again for coming on, um, and I look forward to catching up in person once the the restrictions are, are eased a little bit, and I'm allowed back over the Welsh border. <laughs> Absolute pleasure, pleasure talking to you. Thanks, thanks for the opportunity, Jamie. Thanks very much. I'll speak to you soon. Bye-bye now.